how old are they? Well, by sequencing genomes, we can estimate rates of molecular evolution. We can make phylogenetic trees of viruses. We can put them among the dinosaurs. And in fact, one of the first to be placed there was a herpes virus. So dinosaur had, dinosaurs had cold sores, probably. <laughs> but they probably evolved much earlier. We now uh, can use sequence analysis. We're sequencing many, many viral genomes. Uh, and we can go further back. And we're going to have a lecture on evolution, where we talk about the specific mechanisms that led uh, to the evolution of these viruses. Now, throughout written history, we can find what we think are references to viruses. For example, this, uh, this 700 BC piece of pottery uh, makes a reference to rabid Hector, rabies virus. Uh, here is an Egyptian steel from 1500 BC. This, this individual. His leg looks like he's got polio. We can't say if it is or not, of course, but this is uh, a perfect presentation of polio. In the 11th century, the Chinese were immunizing against smallpox. They didn't know that it was a virus present, but what they knew is that people who survived the disease, smallpox was present for many, many years, the ones who survived were protected. So they said, well, why don't we take one of these pustules and infect people with that, and they'll be protected. And that actually worked. It's called variolation. The problem is it kills 30% of the people who get the vaccine, so that's not a really good safety profile for a vaccine. Um, Lady Montague, who was the uh, wife of the British ambassador to Turkey, she heard about this in Turkey, and she brought it back to the UK, and it spread pretty widely. Now, finally, in the 1790s, Edward Jenner took a logical approach and as we'll hear later in, in uh, the lecture on vaccines, he noticed that milkmaids who got cowpox, a mild form of smallpox on their hands, never got smallpox. So he decided to immunize people with cowpox, and they were protected. That was the first vaccination. And many years later, um, Pasteur called it vaccination in Jenner's honor because of uh, the cowpox story. Now, the, the real advent of virology as a field depended on the contributions of these three individuals. Uh, the first, uh, Anton Leeuwenhoek, who made the first microscopes and made people realize there were smaller things than what you could see. Not everything was a human or an animal or a plant or, or a crab or something. You could see microscopic things. And for many years, people thought these arose by spontaneous generation. And Louis Pasteur put that to rest. He said these microbes, these little things swimming around, arise by reproduction. They don't arise spontaneously. And finally, Robert Koch uh, developed the germ theory of disease. He said these bacteria that Louis discovered and that Louis said multiply on their own, they cause disease. And he established a set of rules, Koch's postulates, to prove that a particular microbe causes disease. But none of these individuals knew about viruses. Viruses didn't come on the scene till after Robert Koch, uh, at the end of his life, at the end of Pasteur's life, in fact. And the reason we discovered viruses was because of cigarettes, OK? Tobacco. This is a tobacco leaf. And at the turn of the century, the end of the 1800s, tobacco was getting to be a big deal. And uh, there were lots of tobacco farms. And the farmers noticed this disease called tobacco mosaic disease, which made the leaves unsuitable to be sold for, for smoking. And a couple of scientists tried to figure out what was causing this disease. And they thought of Coke and his postulates, and they were trying to find a bacterium that caused it. And the way you would do that would be to make extracts of the leaves and then put them through a porcelain filter. And the, the porcelain filter was made in such a way that it had very small holes uh, that bacteria could not go through. And uh, so they would take these leaves and grind them up, make extracts, and put them through these filters. And they never could filter anything that would grow. But they noticed that if they took the filtrate and applied it to leaves, then the leaves would develop the same symptoms of tobacco mosaic disease. So something very small was going through the pores in the filter. They also knew, they learned, that if you took this broth, it would not grow. You would not get more of the agent, whatever it was. 
Only if you added it to a plant leaf could you get more of the agent. So a, a Russian and a, uh, a, a Dutchman uh, made this discovery with tobacco mosaic disease at the end of the 1800s. Uh, Bayerink called it contagium vivum fluidum or virus. Virus is actually Latin meaning slimy liquid or poison. And that's what they thought it was. So they didn't have a concept of a particle. They just had the concept of something passing through the filter, something very small uh, that would not grow unless cells were present. Uh, the first animal virus was foot and mouth disease virus in 1898. Again, the demonstration that the agent of this disease is filterable. And this is, uh, this is what foot and mouth disease virus does to cattle. It causes lesions in their mouth and on their feet, right? Makes perfect sense. And they found that these lesions contained a filterable agents that would cause the disease. So the key concepts here, small agents, they would go through a filter of 0.2 microns in size. And they would replicate only in a host, not in a broth like all of Pasteur's and Koch's bacteria. So that is what distinguished these agents from everything else that had been known. They were very small, and they could only replicate within a host. Now, once those discoveries were made, the field exploded. We then had many other viruses <coughs> discovered. The first human virus in 1901, yellow fever. Um, interestingly, influenza virus, not until 1933. Very interesting, because in 1918, there was a big outbreak of influenza, Spanish influenza, and it was not known that the agent was a virus at that time, only much later. And many, many more viruses uh, have since been discovered. In the 30s and 40s, the electron microscope was discovered. And for the first time, it could be shown that these agents were particulate. Remember, they were called uh, slimy liquid poison because it wasn't clear that they were particles. They didn't know. But now that an electron microscope was, was uh, invented, we could do that. Bacteriophages, here's tobacco mosaic virus. It turned out to be a rod-shaped particle, uh, rabies virus and a virus that causes gastroenteritis, rotavirus. Today we know an incredible amount about viruses. We can solve their structures at atomic resolution. So here on the left is the structure of poliovirus at 1.7 angstroms resolution. That means we can see where every atom is in three dimensions. And we can make images like this by taking the coordinates, the x, y, z coordinates of each atom, and having a, a computer uh, display them. This is 1.7 angstroms. This is about 10 angstroms resolution. You can see you don't see individual polypeptide chains as you do here. You, you see the overall shape of the particle. And because we know the sequence of the genome of many viruses, we can calculate their chemical structures. Here's the chemical formula for poliovirus, probably the most chem complex uh, chemical you've set your eyes on so far. So we know an awful lot about viruses, and, and there are lots of them. And to try and organize what we know, we classify viruses. And this is going to come up a lot in this course. You will see all sorts of names. And to make sense of them, let me explain how classification is done. So there are all sorts of virus particles of all different shapes. But we classify them in very specific ways, depending on the, the nucleic acid in the virion. This is primary. The symmetry of the protein shell, I think you can see by looking at these that some of these shells are very different. And there are very common themes that allow us to classify symmetry into really one of three different uh, shapes. Uh, the presence or absence of a lipid membrane. So some viruses are naked, as we say, like this one. And others have a lipid envelope around them. And that's a distinguishing characteristic. And finally, the, dimension, the dimensions of the virus particle or, or the capsid itself. Now, um, when you classify living things, as you know, you have this hierarchical system, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. Um, viruses don't use all of it. Uh, we typically start with the family. You will see, for example, filoviridae. Families all end in viridae. And this is the filovirus family, and it contains the genus Ebola virus. And within the genus are many species. And for example, one of them is Zaire Ebola virus. And you will see this over and over, viridae, virus, and species. And that's how viruses are classified. Sometimes we put multiple families together to form an order, but um, it's not going to factor much into this course. 
Now, there is an organization called the International Congress on the Taxonomy of Viruses. These are people who meet yearly and decide how viruses should be classified. And so far, they have a website. You can sort through all of these. They have so far uh, classified 40,000 different viruses from all sorts of living things into six orders, families, genera, and species. But this is the drop in the bucket because remember, there are 10 to the 30 bacteriophages in the ocean, and the ICTV uh, has only made a dent in that. So there are a lot more viruses that remain to be classified. And as we sequence with ease, we can do very fast and very massive genome sequencing now. We discover more and more viruses, and that makes it even harder to classify all of them. Uh, I want to give you two examples of uh, this sort of discovery, which are really interesting. So the availability of high throughput massive sequencing allows you to go into the environment and take a sample and discover all the viruses that are in it. So this is one study where um, these individuals went to a lake in Antarctica and they drilled through the ice and they took water samples. And then they brought these back to the lab and just purified whatever was particulate and sequenced the, the DNA within them. And this particular lake they found in just a few samples, 10,000 new virus species, 10,000 species, excuse me, from 12 different families, some of them totally new and not seen before. And this has been done in many environments. It's been done in the oceans. It's been done in mud flats all over the place. And when you do that, you always discover mostly new viruses that you have never seen before. And often you discover new viral genes that you have never seen, so those get put into the database, and now they can be used to search new sequences against. This is a favorite one of mine. This is a, uh, so these are called metagenomic analyses, that is sequencing the genomes of total environmental samples. This is one where they looked at raw sewage. So they went to three different locations in the US, uh, Portugal, and Africa, and they went to a sewage treatment plant and Got, got 10 liters of raw sewage from each place. And they did a little bit of purification, uh, and uh, they did sequencing, and then sorted out all the sequences. They looked at these samples in the electron microscope, and you can see a variety of different virus particles there. Most of these are bacteriophages. Uh, there are viruses that infect bacteria in these sequences, fungi, people, uh, and uh, others. So this is a pie chart which shows you all of the sequences uh, that they obtained and where they mapped to. So most of them you can see are unassigned. These are brand new sequences, but they're viral because the way that they were isolated uh, makes sure that these are viral sequences. So whenever we go into new environments and do this metagenomic analysis, we discover new viruses. And who knows uh, what they're doing? Who knows whether they would be beneficial or useful to us at all? This is one of the really exciting uh, parts of virology. But I don't want you to get overwhelmed by numbers. So I've been telling you that there are lots of viruses, lots of genomes, lots of particles. The purpose of this course is to give you a unifying view of virology. All right. So uh, this, is, this is going to be a key way to simplify all of that. And that is because these viruses are are molecular parasites, there are two things that they have to do. First of all, they have to get in a cell, and that, that way they can make more viruses. And they must all make mRNA. Because no virus encodes any part or any total translation apparatus, all viruses are parasites of the translation system of the host, the ribosomes, the tRNAs, the amino acids, and so forth. All viruses need to use translation apparatus of the host. So they're parasites of that machinery. So this gives us a way to narrow down all the different viruses that we study. So we can look at the pathway to mRNA. And that enables us to simplify uh, the billions and billions of viruses that are present on the planet. 